thing you want to say. At the end, we're going to be uh, meticulous about getting those two-minute rebuttals uh, for people. For the, uh, that's for the debaters. For the uh, commentary, the people on the bottom, on that bottom row, uh, we're asking you to, to give us a four-minute presentation, okay? But the, but the debaters. Okay, so looking uh, at who we have right now, uh, there's no yes or no sides on this. People will tell you what their positions are. Um, I'm going to start with Sister Gloria Brown Marshall. Uh, she is a uh, professor at um, John Jay College and an author of, uh, of several books. And you can take a little time during your two-minute rebuttal to let people know where they can get sales of your books and stuff like that. Please welcome Dr. Gloria Brown Marshall. Good evening. God is good, and all the time, I appreciate the opportunity to be here to speak with you about President Obama. I appreciate the fact that we could have discussions, because I think discussions are needed and necessary within the community. It's been a long time, under eight years of George Bush, that we haven't had the freedom to have talks without feeling that we were going to be persecuted, prosecuted, and discriminated against if we actually exchanged information that differed with the government of this country. So in saying all that, I say thank you for allowing us to have this time. I also want to thank Simultap for doing this because it's necessary for us to do it. We don't all have to agree, but it's good if we could come together even to disagree. I also want to thank James McIntosh. Dr. McIntosh is a brilliant scholar, a dedicated person, and of course, Betty Dobson, and we hold her and her family in our prayers. As a constitutional law professor at John Jay College, I appreciate the fact that we have a former constitutional law scholar in the White House. At least now we know someone knows there is a U.S. Constitution. Up to this point, we knew that the other person not only didn't read it, but didn't want to believe it existed. We now have a president I believe is a good person with a nearly impossible task. And that impossible task is to try to please so many people in a very short period of time. A good person and an impossible task. But we need to put this in some type of historical context because President Barack Obama did not rise up from the earth and, or fall from the sky in this short period of time. I was looking at my father-in-law the other day as we took him out to lunch to celebrate his 91st birthday. My father-in-law is from Bishopville, South Carolina. Came up here, <laughs> Bishopville in the house. Came up here to New York to make his way as a young man. Was a veteran of World War II. Has worked hard and now at 91 years old, I asked him yesterday, did you ever think that you would see a black man in the White House as president? Because there were black men in the White House, but they weren't president. They were serving the presidents. And so he said, no, I didn't. And then he looked at me and said, and I bet you didn't either. <laughs> and I had to agree with him because I didn't. And I can honestly say, I still don't believe it's true. There's a part of me that still doesn't accept that this man is actually president. A part of me is afraid of the fact this man is president. The question is, is President Obama good for black people? I say resoundingly, yes. Is this country deserving of President Obama? I fearfully say no. He has so many skills. He has a personal integrity. He has an intellect. He has a black family that our children need to see. He has a power about him that the world recognizes. Do I agree with everything he does? No. I think there are issues with Afghanistan. I don't want Afghanistan to turn into another Vietnam. I think we have to work on the criminal justice issues that have put a disproportionate number of black people behind bars. I think that we need to find out more about this health care situation. This is something that plagued Bill Clinton when he first started in the White House. The first six months he tried to revamp the health care system, it ended up being bogged down in a political um, quagmire that ended up almost ruining his first four years. 
I also look at this from a historical context of not just what is happening right now, but what gave us the strength to see this man to this point that he's in the White House right now. That of that Jamestown colony of 1607, that very shortly afterwards as was founded, there was the introduction of those 20 Africans in 1619, that the landing of the Mayflower in 1620, and upon the instant of that, those people who were in positions of power then began to use the law to keep us, oppress us, and prevent us from fully recognizing our rights under law in this country. That those those same people were the ones who controlled the vote. So for many centuries, we did not have that right to vote. So then how did we then get a black president after all of this time? Being 13% of, of the American population, black people are 13%, because we can control an election. We can't elect a president. We cannot do that with the numbers we have, but we can control the destiny, the outcome of an election. And that was always known. And that is what we saw here. We want our money's worth. We want our political power's worth. We want our president to recognize what we have been able to do. But don't we think the same thing probably happened to John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the first Catholic and Irish president? Weren't the Catholics and the Irish saying, but are you our president? Or are you just president? If you think about it, there's only been one Catholic president in the history of this country. We also have to think about the fact that there's been no Jewish president in the history of this country. So the time when Joe Lieberman attempted to be vice president of the United States, he still could not get elected. We have a power that is worthy of our having a discussion. We have a power that our elders now see that they've been waiting so long, someone like my father-in-law at 91 years old, who's been waiting this long to see if this is a possibility. When, when President Barack Obama, when he was running for office and they saw that he could win this, gun sales went up two and three times. I know he has some naivete, but I have a feeling, and you do too, this country is a violent place. There are people who do not want him to be in office. I don't say that we give him a free ride because there is so much opposition out there. I say we listen to what he has to say. At this point, he has been in office for six months, eight days, and four hours. I'm not saying that he should give a free ride during this time period, but so far, the man is a good person with an impossible mission that Eight years worth of destruction of disaster has left us nearly in bankruptcy, full of corruption. And I think at this point, not only is President Barack Obama good for black people, but undeservingly so, he's good for this country. Thank you so much. Let Sister Gloria serve as a model. She did it in seven minutes. Give her another round of applause for that. Our next speaker, uh, I've introduced her before, but she is a, a cultural scientist, a former director of the Black Sequence of Courses in the Black and Puerto Rican Studies Department at Hunter College, the author of Urugu. Please welcome to the microphone, Dr. Marimba Ani. Hotep, Alafia, never allow your enemies to choose the game or make the rules because he'll make them to advance his power and to neutralize yours. You can't win. You can't win especially if you try to beat him at his own game because all that you can be then is a better him and you can't be self-determining that way, we say, we want to show him. 